I invite you to remain standing in body or spirit as you are able as we share from God's holy word today. Comes to us from the gospel of Mark as we continue in the last week of Jesus in this Lenten season. We read here a familiar story that always has something new to teach us. Let us receive these words. While they were eating, Jesus took a loaf of bread And after blessing it, he broke it, gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and all of them drank from it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never again drink of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. You may be seated. I want to echo the word of welcome that was shared earlier um, from Reverend Clark. My name is Kathleen McMurray and I'm one of the pastors here. And whether you're joining with us in person or you are joining with us online, we are so incredibly thankful for your presence. Um, It is such a joy and an honor and a privilege to get to lead worship as a part of this community here in Wesley Hall. Um, I'm so thankful to be with you as we continue in our journey on the last week of Jesus and come to what many of us know as Maundy Thursday, Um, Jesus sharing in that last meal with his disciples. Um, As we come into this place today, I know that we come from lots of different places. Um, Some of us who grew up in church are familiar um, with this congregation. Some of us are excited to be here. We're excited to be in worship. And others of us come with some struggles on our hearts. We might um, come with some baggage that church has given us over our lives. Um, But we are reminded as we come into this place that no matter where we are in our lives, no matter where we are in our faith, that God meets us exactly where we are and we are welcomed here. Knowing that we are welcomed, let us turn to God in prayer. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Meals can bring with them a lot of different rituals, right? In my family, as we grew up, we each had our places that we were to sit at the table. Um, We had our assigned seats, so to speak. Um, It wasn't so much assigned, I guess, though, as it just was habitual. We had the places where we were to partake in the meal that we shared as a family. And as we grow older, while um, additional folks have come and become a part of our uh, kinfolk, um, the table has just been expanded and seats have been added. But that ritual of gathering together as a meal, gathering together as a family, sharing that meal has been continued. Another ritual that our family would partake in as we gathered together was that of saying a blessing over the food. Um, Our family, from the time that I was little, has said the same blessing each and every week. Bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts which we are about to receive from thy bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. We know that blessing, we recite that blessing every time that we gather together. And and as my sister-in-law was added to our family um, a few years ago, um, she began to say this blessing as well. And it is being taught to my eight-month-old nephew who has yet to understand the words. But as we gather together, those rituals are taught and passed down and experienced as part of the meal sharing of a family as part of the gathering together and sharing in fellowship and sharing in what it means to be family together. Um, We've also shared in rituals of the types of food that we eat over the years. Today is my dad's birthday and we will gather together for lunch to celebrate his birthday. And we will share in what we 
lovingly referred to as the Bobby Lee Memorial Meal. Um, my grandfather was Bobby Lee, and every time that there was a celebration in his house, we would have steak cooked medium rare. Anything uh, more well done than that was unacceptable in his eyes. Um, and we would have twice baked potatoes uh, made lovingly by my grandmother and broccoli. Um, and we'd have some kind of good, tasty, sugary, glutinous dessert um, that was enjoyed thoroughly by our family. Those rituals, those familiar meals, the blessings that we say around the table become part of who we are. And every time that we share in these meals, share in these rituals, it brings with it certain thoughts and memories and embodiment of family, which is why when families hurt us, those meals can become difficult. When someone dies and their seat is left empty at a table, there is mourning and grief that accompanies that. Meals, the rituals that we partake in together, that we share in together have deep meaning for us because it is something that is shared, it is something that matters. To break bread, to share over food and drink with those whom we dearly love. As Jesus gathered together with his disciples on that Thursday evening, at least according to three of our gospels, it was the Thursday evening as they begin Passover celebration. Passover was a ritual in and of itself. A meal that was shared among believers, remembering when God saved them. Remembering the faithfulness of God as God led the people of Israel out of bondage and slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. It was a celebrate of God's freedom, God's liberation that had happened in the past, but that was also promised in the future as there was a, a hope and a reassurance of God's faithfulness with the people forever. The words that were said, the meal that was shared, these rituals the disciples would have been familiar with, as each and every year from the time that they were born, in their Jewish homes, these prayers would have been prayed, the scriptures would have been read, the meal would have been shared over and over and over, reminding them of God's faithfulness, reminding them of their place in this shared communion of belovedness. And as the disciples are sharing in this familiar meal with Jesus, this familiar meal that reminded them of God's faithfulness, Jesus speaks a new word. As he takes out bread while they were eating, and he says grace, he blesses the bread, and he breaks it, and he gave, gives it to all of them for them to eat. And he said, take, this is my body. And then he took a cup of wine and after giving thanks to God, after blessing it, he shares it with all who are sitting there for them to drink from. And he said, this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly, I tell you, I will never drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Into this holy, this ritualistic, this celebratory meal of God's faithfulness, Jesus speaks a word that is not quite so celebratory, bringing in this idea of his body, of his blood, being broken, being shed, being shared, and this being the last time that he will share in this meal with them. Into this Reminder of God's faithfulness, Jesus speaks an even more faithful promise of God. That he, God his very self, will give his life and love for them. It's really jarring, 
that language that Jesus uses there. I imagine the disciples being struck by the words of their beloved friend who not only tells them again that he is going to die, that this will be the last time that they share in this meal together, despite the fact that he's told them over and over and over again that his his life, his mission, his work will lead him to death, they still struggle to understand it. And here, in the midst of this ritual meal, he shares with them that he is giving them his body, his blood. For the Jewish people, this language was particularly jarring. They were familiar with the idea of sacrifice, Um, At that time, the Jewish people would gather together and offer sacrifices to God in the temple, but never were, were people offered. And certainly, as good, holy Jews, they were not supposed to ever drink blood. That was part of the, the commandments of God going all the way back to Noah. What is it that Jesus himself is, is saying in this? It's jarring. It's unexpected, perhaps uncomfortable. But then again, the whole offering that Jesus gives in this moment is uncomfortable. You see, this meal is shared immediately after Jesus has told the whole of his disciples that are gathered there that one of them will betray him. Immediately, they all turn to one another and look around, not I, not I, wondering who among them will be the one to betray their friend, to hand him over to suffering and death. But Jesus doesn't point out who it actually is. And Jesus doesn't kick Judas out of that holy meal. Instead, Jesus offers all of them, including Judas, his body, his blood, his life, his love. I struggled with this passage a lot this week, if I'm being truly honest. Because there are some people that have done such horrible things, that have caused such great harm, such great trauma to other beloved children of God that I cannot imagine them having a place at Jesus' table. And yet, if Jesus does not dismiss Judas, If if Jesus shares his bread, his body, his blood, his wine, his life, his love, if he invites to the table this one that was in the very process of handing him over to be tortured and publicly executed in exchange for money, if Jesus will eat with even that person, will give his love for even that person, then I don't know that there is anyone whom Jesus does not call us to love, whom Jesus does not invite to the table. I saw a video this week of a youth director who was sharing about his experience in teaching some youth of the church. They had begun a study on the gospel of Luke and they walked through all of Jesus's commandments about what it meant to love God and to love neighbor. That's the essence of what they were supposed to be, who they were supposed to be as followers of Jesus. And he talked with these young people about what exactly that meant. What did it mean to love your neighbor and not only the neighbors that you liked, but your enemies as well? What did it mean to to not only profess to love those enemies, but to pray for them? 
The church that he was serving at at that time was on um, a naval base in 2003. As the war in Iraq and Afghanistan was going on, a number of the parents of those youth were deployed. And so when in this context of loving our enemies, praying for those who hurt us, trying to live like Jesus, he posed the question to his teenagers, who do you think that Jesus might be calling us to pray for? Who is an enemy? whom Jesus might just love. And they shouted out the worst enemy that they knew, Osama bin Laden, for those whose parents were fighting overseas. It was real, this enemy. They wrestled with what that meant for Jesus to love the one who had done so much hurt and harm and damage. But as they were invited to pray for their enemies, they began to add Osama bin Laden to their prayer list every week. And when it came time for them to lead worship in the church, as they set up their communion table, they set up a number of chairs around the table in their sanctuary with cut out pictures of different people who were present and invited to the table of God. They had pictures, cutouts of their favorite Sunday school teacher, of saints in the church, of their pastor. And they had a little cutout picture of Osama bin Laden. As you can imagine, for the adults in the church, this didn't necessarily go over so well. What were those crazy kids thinking? One of the youth was approached by an adult after the worship service who said, really? You think Osama bin Laden was invited to the table of Jesus? And the kids said, I know. I don't like it either. But sometimes I need to know that Christ's grace is that big because I need the grace to be that big for me. In this holy meal, in this last week of Jesus, as he is preparing to die, as he shares in this ritualistic last supper, with his beloved. He makes a statement of belovedness that his love, his grace, his body blessed, broken, and shared is not shared because of anything that we have done. His sharing of his life and love is not dependent on us and praise Jesus that it is not. It doesn't matter how broken we are. We have a place at the table of God. Christ's body and blood are shed and shared for us. And we who are called to be the body of Christ for the world. We're told that in scripture, that we are called to be this body of Christ. We, too, who are blessed and broken, are made whole at the table of God so that we can share in Jesus' life and death and resurrection. What we learn at this table is that there is no one so broken that God cannot make them whole. Sometimes that rubs us the wrong way because we don't want those people to have access to the same grace that we receive. 
But if we're honest with ourselves, sometimes we need to know that the grace of God is that big. That our shame, that our brokenness doesn't prevent us from experiencing the fullness of life and love that we are offered by Jesus. So as we continue this journey to the cross, may we know that the blessed, broken, and shared love of Jesus is for each and every one of us. And that we are a part of sharing that beautiful, blessed, and broken love with everyone we meet. Let us pray. God, only you know the true depth of our hearts. Know what brokenness, what shame, what doubt, what guilt, what anger or hardness we are carrying within us. But also, God, only you are able to transform that into something beautiful and new through your life given, through your love poured out, we know that we are yours. Remind us of that this week, O oh God. Empower us with your spirit to love when love seems impossible, to hold out for the wholeness that comes when the brokenness of our lives seems overwhelming. Transform our hearts and minds and souls, O oh God. Transform our very lives that we may know the life you have for us and for your world. In Christ's name we pray.